Thank you very much, uh, Maria Pia. Thanks for inviting me and welcome to Bologna, welcome to our institute. Um, in fact, what I'm trying to do this morning uh, is to relate the work I do here at IBC, where I work in the museum department, uh, and, and especially on European projects, with your field of research and action. So I, I will relate museums and uh, the territory, museums and communities, museums and the city, of course. Um, so the, the, the title I chose for my presentation, Out of the Box, Museums, Heritage and Communities, I must admit, I borrowed it from an upcoming conference which is taking place in Valletta next week and which is indeed organized by NIMO, the Network of European Museum Organization, Organizations, uh, where I have been board members for many years. And uh, we will come back to NIMO and what it does and how it can be useful for your research um, as a sort of like repository of, of materials and so on. But first of all, I would like to concentrate on these subjects of, on this subject of museums out of the box. What does it mean? It is closely connected to 2018, this year, which is, as you know, uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage. It says here the first European Year of Cultural Heritage, probably also the last one, because I, I heard when they decided, you know, every year the European Union chooses a subject for the year. Uh, there was the Year of Intercultural Dialogue, of, of volunteering, and so on. Uh, and I heard this might be the very last of these years. Um, labeled in a specific way. So uh, anyway, we, we are in the middle of it uh, and indeed uh, the, the objectives of this year uh, put very much heritage uh, in the middle of many connections. So this out of the box is underlining the fact that uh, heritage and museums have to relate to other sectors. Uh, these are some of the objectives of the European of, uh, Year of Cultural Heritage. I just chose a few. Uh, first of all, of course, there is the uh, awareness that uh, cultural her heritage is uh, people-centered, first of all, um, and approaches that are people-centered, inclusive, and, and integrated, sustainable, and cross-sectoral are welcomed and encouraged. Uh, but also, um, the, the year encourages the synergies between cultural heritage, environmental policies, uh, the integration of cultural heritage into other uh, activities, and also into regional and local development strategies. So this crossover effect is something which is uh, very much central key to the year. And this idea of connecting heritage with other sectors and also underlining the importance of cultural heritage for a variety of policies has been with us for many years. Now I'm just referring to this document which is called Towards an Integrated Approach of, to Cultural Heritage for Europe, uh, which was uh, released in 2014. This was the outcome of uh, the work of the Greek presidency of the EU. You know that every three years, every I'm sorry, six months, uh, a member state takes on the, the presidency of the EU and so leads the, the work in all the different fields. And in that period, we had the trio. There's a trio of, of uh, countries uh, passing the testimony one to another. So there was Lithuania, Greece, and then Italy, and so on. And these, in those years, so 2013, 14, 15, uh, this, um, this say, uh, idea of, of underlining, of bringing for, uh, forward the, the value of heritage for other sectors was very strong. And from there, of course, it went on. And it's still with us, of course, as we have seen in the uh, objectives of the, of the current European year. So the, the issue now is, what is the legacy of the, this year going to be? And there is a lot of effort put into making this, uh, all these activities that uh, have been carried out and are being carried out still in 2018, something which goes on in the future. In the new agenda for culture, I don't know if you're aware that in May 2018, uh, a new agenda for culture was published. Uh, the previous one was 2007, so it stayed with us for 10 years, so presumably this one will also stay with us for a long period. Uh, it is based on different dimensions, the social dimension of heritage, the economic dimension of heritage, the external dimension of heritage, 
and the digital dimension, which is, of course, very, very central and, and, and very uh, current also. Uh, the priorities that the agenda sets are also very much related to the objectives of the European cultural heritage. So again, the dialogue with other sectors, the crossover between uh, heritage and uh, health, well-being, education, creative industries, and one of the priorities is also the one that I mentioned before, that this year has to leave some legacy, that we have to really work so that all the work and all the discussions and the debates that we've had during this year are, are not just left there for no one to look at. So uh, these documents, uh, the, the, this document, along with another one, uh, are the documents that I would use to frame the discourse this morning. On the one hand, the uh, priorities and the objectives of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, and on the other hand, the Faro Convention, which dates 2005, this was not uh, issued by the uh, European Union, but by the Council of Europe. And it's called the Convention on the Value of Cultural Her Heritage for Society. So um, it really states very many important uh, principles, I think, uh, with regard to cultural heritage and also the relationship between heritage and people, individuals, communities, and so on. And also, again, the importance of cultural heritage as a resource for sustainable development and quality of life. And the involvement that everyone in society should have uh, in defining and managing cultural heritage, which is, as we all know, a cultural good. So it's a good that belongs to, at the same time, no one but everyone, like water, like air, and so on. So it is something for which we should feel a responsibility and we should engage. Now this convention has had, uh, until now, 17 countries, I think, as of today, uh, that have ratified it. Italy has approved it, but not ratified it yet. It is in the process. Um, again, uh, important principles of this convention, uh, the recognition of the individual and collective responsibility towards cultural heritage, the fact that the conservation of cultural heritage uh, has a value uh, for human development and, and to uh, also achieve quality of life, uh, that it is also useful for the construction of a peaceful and democratic society, and also to promote cultural diversity. And finally, a very important concept that the, the, the FARO Convention highlights is that of a heritage community, that this definition of heritage community um, as a, a community of people who value specific aspects of cultural heritage, which they wish to sustain and transmit to future generations. So again, this responsibility of people, individual, and as community. And here the convention brings out a very important uh, principle again, a very important component, which is the value. The value of heritage is what we attach to, to, to heritage. If we we uh, define and we recognize heritage the very moment when we attach a value to it. And I thought I would present this uh, model uh, developed by a Swedish um, researcher and uh, academic person, Bosse Langerquist, to analyze the different uh, stakeholders' needs and values. Uh, this one was developed with regard to industrial heritage. Industrial heritage which is um, no longer used and that communities might want to use so, or, or reuse. So the, the, the uh, connection, the perception uh, of why this should be regarded as heritage can be based on emotions uh, or on knowledge, so a more cognitive approach or a more emotional approach, individually oriented or collectively oriented. So this, this is a quite complex, uh, say, a uh, picture of how heritage can be differently understood and defined and perceived by individuals and groups. Along with these two documents, the document um, pointing out all the elements of uh, the European the priorities of the European Year of Cultural Heritage and the Paro Convention, because we are in Italy, I would like to mention the, the Senate Charter, uh, which was uh, 
developed by ICOM Italy in 2014, and which was the basis for um, also the, the, the ICOM General Conference the, for the selection uh, um, of, the, of the theme on which the ICOM General Conference, which took place in Italy in 2016, focused. And it is Museums and Cultural Landscapes. Uh, they, in Italy, we say, Italy, you know, when, when referring to museums, Italy is an open air museum. Yes, there are institutions, but wherever you go, and here, of course, we're also in a museum, so to say, um, wherever you go, you find uh, the cultural heritage uh, resources, uh, monuments, uh, roads, uh, bridges, whatever. Uh, and, and so um, the idea of uh, focusing in Italy in particular on uh, museums and cultural landscapes, which I understand also as museums and the territory, so museums and the surrounding, and the surrounding area or the surroundings, this is very typical of, of our country. Uh, very recently, the Ministry for Cultural Heritage um, produced and published the, what we call the um, standards for quality for museums in order also to, to uh, create a national museum system of all the museums that comply with these standards that, have, uh, that, that uh, shows that they are, that they have these requisites. And one, um, and, and of course there have been uh, in, in, in Europe and, and in the world really very many other uh, accreditation schemes based on, on quality uh, for museums and on quality standards. Uh, the, the, very difference, uh, the very difference that, that uh, the Italian standards have is in that additional, say, uh, area which is called the relationship between museums and the territory. Again, to underline this very close connection between museums and uh, the, the landscape and the surroundings. And in fact, I regret, I thought I had put those publications, but they will come, we'll put them somewhere, we will agree where, and they, you will find them, to, are you going to be here tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, they, you will find them on, on that uh, table tomorrow, and uh, along with maybe another one that came to mind, that you might find interesting. Uh, this publication which we produced, uh, we IDC produced in 2016 um, on the occasion of the ICON General Conference on Museums and La uh, Cultural Landscapes was indeed to show the variety of ways in which museums from Emilia Romagna relate to the territory. And we, there are many case studies, very short presentations, uh, also in, in, in English, uh, going from a typical museum as an eco-museum which has a relationship, not only a relationship but which identifies itself with the territory like the one in Argenta which is also very active in involving citizens in producing these community maps which are sort of like also emotional maps where uh, important uh, buildings and monuments are uh, sketched and identified, but also intangible heritage is, is drawn on these maps, or uh, like the, uh, the Marsh uh, Grasses Museum, again an Apocalypse Museum in Bagna Cavallo, which, uh, in, where the museum engages the community to decide, a sort of like in a sort of like self-analytical uh, process or exercise to identify the ways in which this uh, river could be made uh, more sustainable, uh, could be integrated into touristic uh, itineraries, and so on. So it is uh, very much uh, linking uh, the, the collection of the, of the uh, museum itself with the environment, and also with public policies, with environmental and, and other policies. Another example is the, the Port of Sais in, in Cesenatico. This is a maritime museum. Uh, which has offered to private people uh, the, a mooring place to put their private boats, which are, however, historical boats. And so in that way is engaging, this is a very uh, special, uh, say, landscape, and, uh, a maritime, a seascape, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, it is also, uh, in this way, um, conserving traditions and, and the intangible heritage connected to, to seafaring. So, I mean, I'm just mentioning a few, but you will find many. I don't remember how many we put together.
together 2030, but there are several. And another one, which is contained in that book, is Modena. Uh, it's my story in Piazza Grande. Now, Piazza Grande is also a UNESCO site. Modena is a city that you will pass through uh, while going to Parma. And, uh, and the museum is in charge of the management of this UNESCO uh, site. Uh, so the, the management of the site is entrusted to, to the museum, which has a Romanesque uh, church and the Gerlandino Bell Tower and the square itself. And um, what the museum did uh, recently, the last years, was also to prompt citizens to provide stories connected to the, the square. How it, stories and pictures and documents, because it is my story in Piazza Grande. So, uh, you know, personal connection to, to heritage. And staying in Modena, because it is very obvious that museums, especially, especially archaeological museums, have a connection to the territory. They are naturally out of the box. Uh, and they do, for instance, conserve the, the finds of the digs uh, in the city, but especially last year, uh, to celebrate the 2,200 years of the, of the Emilia, this uh, historical Roman world, there were very uh, many initiatives, not only in Modena, but also in Reggio Emilia and in Parma. And uh, what Modena did uh, was, of course, to put up a, a very nice exhibition uh, to create virtual visits on the website where one could identify and look at the different, uh, say, uh, Roman um, sites of the amphitheater, uh, etc. Uh, but also, and, and a variety of educational activities, uh, workshops, and so on. And also, which I found very, very nice, uh, to connect also contemporary production, artistic production, and uh, the ancient Modena was uh, um, an initiative which brought together several 3D artists and they, on the street, uh, painted these uh, uh, tromplay uh, recreation of, of, of the places. So you would go there and you would stand on the brink of the theater or the amphitheater and, and, and you would know in a much more effective way that that was the place where, you know, uh, the Roman city developed. So, just to name a few, but you can also, I thought I would point out to you, there's also a, a committee, an international committee of ICON, which is CAMOP, which deals with um, a, a, a city museums. And so they, they have a, a, a a bulletin, which the newsletter, which they send out regularly, and there is a lot of interesting material about what city museums do, and again, the vocation of city museums is that of having a connection with, with the city, right? So much for Emilia Romagna, but now I was quite intrigued by the title of one of the presentations that you will hear in the coming days, and by Giovanni Semi, which is called, he titled his presentation, People as Heritage, and I don't know whether he meant this or not, but what I interpret, the way I interpreted it, and now I'm moving from the museum and its connection to the territory, to the heritage, to the connection of museums and people, whether they are heritage or not, but anyway, that is also for me another very strong aspect of being out of the box. And to do that, I will move from Emilia Romagna to Europe. And I would like to mention this uh, discussion paper, the 2020 discussion paper of the UK uh, Museum Association. Actually, they launched it in 2010. And the question to the museum it was a consultation paper. So they prompted uh, replies from the museums. The question was, what will people want of their museums in 2020? So again, uh, people-centered approach. And it turned out that museums thought that in 2020, people would want museums to make a difference for individuals, for communities, for societies, for the environment. Now, this document you will find online uh, is dated because we are now approaching 2020. I mean, it's not recent, but it's very interesting also in terms of the different links and with the references it provides. Now, there's a very long uh, list of references, uh, so it's, it's interesting. Um, also a nice design, very popular. Uh, so impact on individuals, in what terms? Learning, 
quality of life, skills and confidence and well-being. And to give you an example, this does not come from the UK but from Stockholm. We hosted uh, these people in a conference here some years ago. The City Museum of Stockholm organized guided tour in the city for the city workers like taxi drivers, like guards, like the mounted guards around the, the, the royal palace and so on. People that would spend their life, their, their, their daily life on the streets without knowing what was around them. I thought that was, and being bored, because if you are on, you know, on a horse waiting for the royal couple to go out or whatever, it is also a rather boring uh, job. And so the, the, the museum thought uh, of, of making it a bit more lively by uh, teaching these people, showing these people what the, the cultural heritage of the city was. And it was a very successful project which took place partly outside, so in the streets and partly also at the museum looking at maps and documents and archival documents and so on. This is a very different kind of thing, uh, very much based on people, uh, on people with difficulties. And the Manchester Museum provided to these people a project in order to uh, engage them to become eventually volunteers of, of museums but actually using heritage uh, more as a pretext to deliver other skills like self-competencies, -com like self-confidence, like uh, a desire to learn, to go back into the learning cycle and so on. So it was a, 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 a training program which was partly focused on cultural heritage and the heritage of the city and of the museum and partly on delivering these additional skills or these other skills. And it turned out that some people actually went back into a learning cycle. Some of them went back to learning, to, to register for university and so on. This is, a, of course, a very, a very um, different approach of what museums or also outcome of what museums can do for individuals. But if you're interested, this website, again, of the Museums Association, gives uh, endless examples of how museums can change lives. And there are many programs that are reported there, and there is, of course, this campaign that Museums Association launched uh, to encourage museums to work along those lines. Impact on communities, a uh, sense of identity, a place to meet, economic activity, participation, I'm going quickly. Uh, again, clearly museums provide sometimes just a, a place to socialize. There's nothing bad, nothing wrong with that. Uh, a sense of identity, and this is a typical volunteering uh, work that people uh, lend to museums because they feel that they belong to the organization. And participation, like uh, you know, when uh, a museum needs to be refurbished or redeveloped, plans are discussed with, uh, this is a museum in, uh, in Finland. Uh, discussed with the community. Um, we will go back to this issue of participation in a moment. Impact on society in terms of knowledge, cultural and social justice. And I thought here I would show you uh, a picture that uh, in the understanding of, uh, of Dutch colleagues, do we have any Dutch people here? Ah, good, good. So you, you can read this, so even we do, <laughs> even if we don't speak Dutch. So this was someone from the Dutch Heritage Agency showing how, in his understanding, uh, museums are not uh, the owner of, are not the exclusive owner of knowledge, but are in a net or in a network, not, no longer at the center, but as a knot in a wider, in a wider net, which is, for instance, uh, exemplified by this uh, natural history museum in Leiden, which has uh, um, which is engaging people in uh, contributing to uh, make a list of biodiversity in the country. This is done both, both by archaeological museums and natural history museums. It's a typical uh, crowdsourcing uh, project. So museums in that sense contribute to knowledge, but also impact on the planet, uh, less energy, transition to a greener economy, and this is done not only by organizing uh, exhibitions on a more sustainable uh, future or uh, environmental awareness and uh, sustainability in general, but also very recently um, I saw the, um, a 
production by the Alberta Museums Association, so a Can Canadian association that produced some videos and made them available for the museums to either use them uh, in connection to their exhibitions uh, on taking action on climate change because of course museums are also players in today's society. The social role of museums uh, is, very, is very clear and has grown in, in recent years. So also in terms of climate change, sometimes museum makes, uh, museums make their choices uh, evident to us in the rooms, in the galleries, by, uh, by uh, telling us we're keeping the lights low, or we're keeping the temperature low because of this and that. And so, uh, the, in that sense, museum, museums can also say, uh, be a good role model for, for citizens. And talking about the social impact and the social role of museums, I thought I would bring out this uh, model, which was developed by Mark O'Neill at the time, the uh, person responsible for the city museums in Glasgow, or a city museums in the city. Uh, because in Glasgow, they, they do UK people. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have a variety. Good. Um, in Glasgow, as far as I understand, they, they practice what they preach. And what they preach is this. There are different models of uh, museums. The elite model, which is the art for the art's sake, or the culture for the culture's sake. So they say collections are the core, right? Everything is done for collections, which, is, which was pretty much the model that we all experienced until uh, a few, well, a few, some decades ago. Uh, the welfare model is basically, again, an elitist model uh, where other functions of museums, uh, of, of the museum have been added onto, like uh, education, like marketing, but basically the elitist model remains. And then finally we have the social justice model, which acknowledges that museums, like all social institutions, have the responsibility to meet the, the, the society standards of justice and also to rectify injustices. So they engage, the engagement uh, with people is the responsibility of all staff. Displays are built on accessible principles and the community co-produces the museum narrative. Where are you from in the UK? Uh, not far from Manchester. Oh, no. that would have been, a, 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 that would have been nice if you had been from Glasgow, but maybe you know the, the museums there. And they do have, for instance, uh, these are the, some of the museums, they have a built, um, the, these are the, the, it's called the resource center, actually these are, these are the storerooms, there is just one deposit, just one uh, warehouse where all the, the collections uh, that are not on display are kept. And this resource center is also used as an educational center, so it's open. And indeed, uh, what do they call themselves? They call themselves the Open Museum. And what they do, which reflects this, uh, say, a commitment to social justice, is uh, going out to communities, especially in the most uh, disadvantaged areas, uh, and bring out objects, but also the knowledge and the expertise of the people uh, to encourage people to produce their own, uh, their own shows, uh, their own uh, displays, their own research. So it is very much uh, sort of like uh, making available what the, the organization has in terms of objects, in terms of knowledge, and so on, to empower people. The Riverside Museum in Glasgow is a, is a newly built, well, not newly, some years ago. Uh, the collection is the collection of the Transport Museum, which was relocated in, in this brand new Zaha Hadid uh, building. And before the, the, the building was completed and the collection was redisplayed, uh, <coughs> the museum engaged uh, five different panels of uh, different target groups that it wanted to address. So there was the community panel, there was the accessibility uh, panel made of all the people and organizations with different abilities or disabilities in order to ensure that uh, the museum would really um, meet the needs. Uh, and they also had uh, uh, the, what was it, the team panels, the education panel, the teachers panel, the education panel including teachers and so on. So all in all, and, and the intercultural, the multicultural panel. 
in order to ensure that all these different target groups would uh, have their expectations met. So it was a lot of consultation and all the, the whole process is documented online, you find the, the proceed, these proceedings uh, of these meetings and, and all the material that has been produced. It's very heavy going uh, process if you actually go into it, which leads me to speak of another important uh, keyword and uh, action that most museums are undertaking at the moment. It seems to be what everyone is doing or would like to do, which is to become a participatory organization. Are you familiar with the Nina Simon publication, 2010? Uh, it's also online, um, as well as its developments, because that is 2010, so all that came out afterwards is also available. What it says, it moves, as we see here, from an organization, well, I should have <laughs> put the traditional institution to the left. Anyway, traditional institution uh, conveys a message top down, and the participatory institution is an institution where the message goes both ways, down and up, up and down, and I would say also horizontally between individuals. Individuals uh, uh, communicate with each other through heritage and thanks to heritage and, and museum collections. So the participatory museum in asylum says um, uses uh, the institution as a meeting place to start a dialogue about the present con the presented content and instead of being on something or for someone, it is created and managed with the visitor. So this idea of co-production, of collaboration is very, very strong. Now Nina Sam Simon uh, identifies uh, four different ways in which an organization can be either participatory or participative. Uh, it, and they are on a continuum, mm, from a minimum to a maximum. Going from contributory projects, um, where people are prompted to provide some input, but basically the process is managed and controlled by the organization, by the museum, to collaborative projects where this collaboration is a bit stronger, to co-creative projects, which are led in more, say, equal, uh, at a par level, to hosted projects where, like in the case of the European Museum in Glasgow, as we saw, the museum offer itself as a venue for others to produce and to stage something. And there are also other, um, other categorizations of these, uh, of these elements. Again, going from a minimum, which is information, to a maximum, which is supporting independent community interests and initiatives. And because I was uh, myself engaged in, in, uh, in the research on participatory governance of cultural heritage, which is, uh, say, uh, one of the important subjects that is debated now at European level, and I produced two documents, uh, a position paper in 2015, and with other colleagues also a mapping of participatory practices uh, in, in Europe, also in 2015. Uh, moving from these premises that uh, participatory governance is important because it contributes to the long-term sustainability of the cultural institution and to the enrichment of the communities involved. So it is, in a way, uh, also because the institutions uh, want to create the conditions for uh, the museum to, to, to live and, and to be supported uh, with, with external resources, also due to the lack of resources. So it's not only out of goodwill, say, uh, that, uh, that museums or institute, cultural institutes become participatory, but because also of the need to actually uh, receive resources from the outside world. But anyway, um, this is participatory governance of cultural heritage, again a definition given by the, the, the European Union uh, people-centered process to increase accountability and transparency of public resources, investment, etc., etc. Uh, the FARO Convention also gives uh, a definition of participation. But what I wanted to say is that while doing this research, we um, try to put the different case studies that we collected on a map, which would have a minimum of involvement of people, 
the left hand side on the continuum to a maximum, so between information and hosting, top down and bottom up. And uh, uh, so the case studies that we have collected and studied uh, go from contributory projects like, in fact, uh, by this uh, Finnish museum engaging the community in rethinking the display of the museum, uh, so submitting the drafts of the architect and actually engaging in a quite sometimes intense conversation um, to the project of the redevelopment and redisplay of the Glasgow Museum, the Riverside Museum, with all the contributions of these different advisory panels, to, in some cases, uh, digital participation, because community is no longer a term which means something which is related to a place or geographically based, but in the digital world and the digital shift, a lot of participation is done uh, through digital means. So this Butterfly Atlas um, was uh, initiated by the uh, state uh, national uh, natural history museum in Denmark that asked people to georeference uh, the observation of butterflies in the country so as to have a mapping of where they were. And on the other hand, the State Museum in Leipzig, when they uh, digitized their collections, they, they put them online, and this is a city museum, of course, so objects are connected very closely to the history also of inhabitants. And therefore, they put a reply button where people could add information that they owned and that museum didn't own uh, related to, to the object. So a very, again, a participatory pro uh, process uh, supported by digital means. Or um, the um, Open Air Museum in Estonia, which started uh, a program for the owner of rural buildings, so buildings in private hands, that needed uh, upkeep, restoration, maintenance. So the museum transferred these skills to, to private people so that they could take care of this private heritage, which is the heritage and everybody's heritage in the end. Or they adopt a monument uh, scheme, uh, which was initiated in 1990, so a long time ago, by uh, Archaeologists Scotland, uh, which tried to find a solution for uh, the, the organizations like amateur uh, archaeologists that wanted to intervene on objects or sites uh, in private possession. So the Archaeology Scotland, which is a, a public body, uh, produced guidelines, produced a toolkit, and uh, also an agreement that these private uh, associations or learned societies should uh, sign uh, together with the owner and with the archaeology Scotland itself in a sort of like a triangular uh, model uh, to, uh, to intervene so that everybody's uh, needs and interests would be uh, kept together. And also Netherlands, uh, Memory of the East, this was a project initiated by the City Museum of Amsterdam in 2002, I think, so quite a long time ago, they produced uh, uh, an exhibition on, uh, on the East, on East Amsterdam, and uh, um, uh, with, with objects, but also uh, put up a website where people could upload their stories. So this is a website of stories which remain afterwards, and, and is still there, and people upload, continue. So it's become totally self-managed uh, by, by the community, and it is the typical hosting project. And again, uh, Glasgow. The uh, National Museum of Wales is, uh, they, they claim that their uh, St. Pagans, their, their Open Air Museum is one of the biggest, you know, probably the largest in Europe. And it was developed in the 1960s to sort of like preserve this sense of identity of a nation. You know that in the UK you have two, four countries, right? Wales is one. And now, uh, moving from 1960 to 2000 and more, uh, they wanted to, um, to inquire into the contemporary sense of identity, into contemporary uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish um, Welsh people. And
And so they engage with 120 different organizations and communities to try and develop a common narrative. And finally, because we are in Bologna, this uh, is not initiated, was not initiated by Muslim, but by the city. Um, in 2001, uh, our constitution um, incorporated a principle of subsidiarity, horizontal subsidiarity, so that um, um, in order to <coughs> take care of common goods, it is the organization which is closest to it that should intervene. And then other organizations up, higher up in the hierarchy in the case that the uh, organization that's closer does not intervene. So the, the city uh, mapped the, the different uh, organizations that wanted to take care of common goods in the city, being public parks or the, the activities would be uh, cleaning graffitis or taking care of, of public gardens or so on, and, uh, and produce something which is very important and which is a, a, a regulatory framework. Uh, because these uh, collaborations between uh, the, 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 the model, the format, has been uh, also adopted by other cities in Italy. It's called uh, um, Common Goods, um, the city as a common good. And uh, because these, these, the regulatory, these regulations, the regulatory frameworks are necessary in order to bring together the activities of private people and the interests of the city as a whole. So, I'm quickly coming to a close uh, and to say that uh, a participatory institution is an organization that understands that the stakeholders can contribute to the achievement of its mission and objectives and puts in place all strategies to create the conditions for the co-creation of content, of narratives and values, it is at the same time an organization that is ready to relinquish, to seize some of its authority. Inevitably, if you open your doors to others that are not part of the institution, you have to be very ready to, uh, to start a dialogue, and this dialogue has to be real. So, which means also that uh, people working in the organization uh, have to change their approach and they have to become brokers, so to say. They have to um, take on a, a mediating, a, a facilitating role. Um, the benefits of participation are definitely that of creating a greater sense of collective ownership in the community, which means, again, in terms of sustainability, if uh, someone, uh, if funds are lacking, if uh, someone will want to close the museum, and there is this sense of identification of belonging to the organization, if you have developed this over time, then it will be much easier that someone raises his hand and say no, or does something practically to uh, raise funds or, 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 or contribute to, the, uh, to maintaining that organization open. The, Promotion of well-being and quality of life is another uh, outcome of participation and, as I was mentioning before, the uh, sustainability of the cultural organization involved. But participation requires frameworks like the one that the city of, uh, of, of the, the city of Bologna put into place and policy mechanisms to allow shared governance, transparency and information and also adjustments in the governance structure and change in the organizational culture of the organization and the training of people because people working in a cultural organization not necessarily know how to facilitate participatory processes. And also, uh, to be very honest, one has to look uh, into the outcomes of participation. Is it really participatory? Is it real participation? And in this case, uh, is it rhetoric or reality? Some, uh, there is a lack of evaluation studies on this, also because they require not only talking to the organization, but especially talking to the people, how they feel, how much they feel they have been honestly uh, involved, uh, and, and uh, uh, how much do they feel they have been used, so to say, to rubber stamp uh, a document or, or policy of the organization which wanted to be participatory work, but was not in the end. So some uh, research uh, along these lines have been done by 
Bernadette Lynch, and this Whose Cake Is It Anyway is a publication which uh, dates some years ago and went in depth into the story of 12 uh, UK museums. But what Nina Simon also tells us nowadays, after eight years from the uh, publishing of its book, uh, is that cultural heritage uh, should be uh, used as a resource for capability development and self-determination. So we should focus not only on what people can do for the institution in terms of participation, but even more on what people can do for themselves by using institutional resources. So this is turning the, the uh, paradigm of, of participation a bit upside down. And most important of all, because we're all living in times of declining uh, financial resources, uh, this transfer of decision-making to community should never be used to cover up a lack of funding resources on the public side, because participatory projects are not cheap. Very often they are expensive, because they require a lot of time, they require a lot of effort, and, and very, very seldom uh, some uh, participatory projects can then, you know, move on and be uh, set fun. Now, because I'm coming to an end and I want to give credit to the organization uh, which uh, provides a lot of information uh, on museums and its, uh, and museums and their efforts uh, to be actors uh, on the public scene and because it was also mentioned in the beginning, a few words on Nemo the network of European Museum Organizations, which is, um, was a network starting in 1992, as most of, uh, of the European networks were started. Uh, it has members in 40 uh, member states of the Council of Europe, and uh, it claims to be the voice of uh, museums in Europe. It is indeed the only existing museum network in Europe. It is ba bases its work on four values, uh, quite, uh, say straightforward, the values that we all acknowledge as being the values of museums, the value of collections as the core value of museums, uh, the value, the economic value of museums, the educational value of museums, I mean you can find them all, and the publication on the four values with, with uh, case studies that exemplify all these uh, four values and the social value that we have been looking into this morning. Uh, NEMO is um, a network which uh, creates a forum for discussion uh, for museum professionals of the different countries. Its membership is not individual, it is organizational, it's, it's, it's institutional. Uh, it wants to advocate uh, the um, advocate museums to the European Commission, and on the other hand, it wants to bring the message uh, and information from the European Commission to museums. So it works in this way. Uh, the opportunities of networking that NEMO provides also for people who are not members or organizations that are not members, so also for, for individuals. Now, this is open to members only. It's training courses. Um, international works, uh, workshops on business models and good man management of museums and museum organization. And the last one that was delivered, was organized, uh, happened in September, um, housed and hosted by the House of European History on how to develop and deliver a multilingual narrative. You know that they developed their narrative in 23 European language, languages, so quite a challenge for them that they share with, with new members. Learning exchange is also open to members and the next one is going to uh, happen uh, um, in the UK, in London, focused on this uh, uh, museum change life campaign and program that I mentioned before. And we also hosted a, a study visit in, in Bologna a couple of years ago. Uh, webinars, these are open for anyone and the most recent one uh, was delivered a few days ago on uh, museums and makers, makers in residence, how museum professionals can collaborate with local creative partners and also with digital creatives. And the working groups, the working groups are uh, focused on different subjects, 
uh, on uh, education, on advocacy, on creative industries, and they are, again, open to, to members. And the next uh, working group meetings will happen uh, within the framework of, um, of the general conference uh, taking place in Valletta uh, next week, which is indeed the out-of-the-box conference to which I will go today. So here I close the circle. I thank you. There's five minutes left for questions or even more.